the overall goal of the binning is to take one of these metagenomic samples and extract one or more high quality genomes out of the sample. So we remember when we looked at the classification, so the work we're gonna be doing in here, by the way, is in this metagenomic binning folder in the workspace. So if we look at, got a copy of this chart. So this is the Corona chart from that sample. And so we see that we've got this, you know, large number of reads that belong to Haemophilus influenzae. And what we'd like to be able to do is sort of pull those out into its own genome so we can look at it. Remember, too, that when we looked at the read mapping of the reads onto the reference homophilus, you know, Rebecca noted that, you know, this was the reference. This wasn't the actual genome that we were looking at. You know, it, you know, it might be interesting to you know, bin this genome and then, you know, remap that perhaps and see how this how these fit and compare the one we pulled out to the references. And we'll go through later on how we do that. I'm going to back up a little bit further. Down here in this uh, Prello et al. is a paper that um, describes the tool we're using here. It was developed at Argonne. This is what basically the foundation for this service, is this paper. So, you know, everything I say, you'll find in more detail in here about the act. This goes into, you know, a good amount of detail onto how the algorithm works. How does the bidding work? The, the bidding workflow starts with a set of reads, you know, just like we've been doing the rest of our tools. We assemble those using one of the metagenomic assemblers, either MegaHit or Metaspades, depending on the input, to give us you know, lar larger contigs to work with. These contigs, we, um, we do some pre-processing quality checks, and we blast these against a set of reference proteins. So the way that the, the way the binning works is we collect the set of FES genes, um, phenylalanine synthetase alpha unit, I believe. These are genes that occur in a very large number of the genomes in Patrick in a single copy. So we use this as an anchor to bin the contigs into genomes. So the, we do a, a blast against these uh, FIES examples to get a set of initialized bins. Then we have a set of algorithms that use the first 12 mer protein kamers to recruit additional contigs into the bins based on the reference genomes that the FIES hits matched. And we do a further match of using DNA camers, you know, to try and pull, pull additional contigs in. And then we run these bins through the um, annotation service that Jim will tell you about next. But we'll, we'll, get, we'll get a look at what's going on there. Uh, and then we do some post-processing. We come up with these final bins. Uh, there's some post-processing that will clean up some of the contamination that may come in in this process. We also, when we have these bacterial contigs that we've created... We scan the non-bacterial contigs and use the check V tool, which identifies viruses to pull out potential viral bins. And then uh, we'll attempt to run those through the viral annotation of BVBRC, which is works in some viral families, not everything. And then we'll report on those as well. I think right now, Bob, that only mega did. I don't think you put metaspades. The way it's intended to work, we support both, but metaspades is picky. It will run only on a single paraden read set. When we get there, I'll show you what's going on with that. So we'll go over here under metagenomics. We have a metagenomic binning tool. And this will look familiar now. It sense a theme with these tools, right? We start out by choosing whether we're going to use reads or assemble contigs. If you you can come into this if you've already um, assembled your reads, you know, for some other project or using using your own assembler or whatnot, you can start with those. We're going to start with reads here. And we're going to pick our input. Let's see if I remember. You are seven nine one two six two. Okay. If you're following on before, this should be easy, right? So we'll just select that and we'll move it into the selected libraries. By the way, there's this little eye icon here that if you hover over this, it will show you the, if it's able to find it, the SRA metadata read title for this uh, read set that you can use to double check that this read is what, you're, what you think you're putting in. And we know that sometimes the SRA metadata is lacking in precision, let, let us say. So we can choose our parameters. Also, another thing is that whenever you see one of these little eyes on here, we get some more information. So we can see that our three options here are Metaspace, Mega Hit, and Auto. Auto will pick the most appropriate strategy where, where here appropriate is if it can use Metaspades, it will. Um, in the case where you just have a single paradigm library input, otherwise it'll use Mega Hit. And with an SRA accession, you can't select Metaspades. 
because it doesn't know yet if it's the right kind, because it hasn't downloaded the data yet to know if it was a, the right kind of library. This one, if you use auto, it would probably assemble with Metaspace. And under organism interest, remember back when we looked at the picture, we had these two branches at the end where we did the bacterial annotation and binning and the viral annotation and binning. And you can choose here what you want to have done. We're going to leave this at both right now, but if you're, if you're actually interested in the viral content of things, it's interesting to run the binning both with binning the bacteria out first and not binning the bacteria out first. Because when you bin bacteria, any of the reads that went with the bacteria aren't available for doing the viral binning. And so you may get different results. Whether or not the different results are meaningful is up to you, but uh, this is something to keep an eye on. Our output folder, we'll, we'll name it as we named it before. So there's another option here that we had, haven't seen before which is a genome group name. And remember, genome groups let you group genomes together for easy reference. In the binning job, you can give it a genome group name here so that all of the generated genomes from this job will be put in a genome group. So you can go back and easily find all the genomes that were associated with this run. We'll just call this the binning group. The other thing to note here, I'm not sure if we talked about that some of these interfaces have an advanced dropdown that typically are options that may or may not be interesting to change. So here we've got the thing that says to disable search for dangling contigs. Remember there was this 50 mer DNA lookup step that we had. For very large samples, that can take a ton of memory and may crash your job, or may, you know, we may not be able to give you enough memory for it. Um, if you have problems with that, you can click this checkbox and uh, you, your job may get through more, more readily. And you can also change the minimum contact length and minimum coverage. This is on the initial filter after the assembly to remove the chaff context from consideration. So if you're interested in tinkering with that, you can, you can change those values. But we, def we default to pretty reasonable values here. So now we can go ahead and submit the job. And there we go. Because this is assembly-based, these jobs can take a while to run. <laughs> Uh, particularly because the you know large metagenomic data sets can take a very long time to assemble. The time spent varies based on you know the size of the job and the complexity of it. Like we've had folks that have submitted soil metagenome samples that can run for days, right, just for the assembly. And as usual, if your job ran and crashed, what would you do then? What do you do if you have a bad job? You just sit there and take it. And say, I guess I'm a failure too. With the assembly and bidding jobs in particular, if you have a job that fails, we will take a look at it and we may well restart it with either more time or a larger memory allocation. The way the backend services work is that we try to make a fairly conservative guess about how long your job is going to take and how much memory it will need in order to optimize, you know, placing the jobs onto the compute cluster that's behind this. And it's just a guess, right? And it's easy for us, particularly in these complex binning jobs, easy for us to guess wrong. So if you uh, send a ticket saying this job crashed, you know, we'll probably look at it and say, okay, well, first thing we'll do is just, you know, we'll double the time allocation and give it more memory and see how it goes. You know, that's something we can easily, easily help you with. All right, so let's look at the output of this guy. Oh yeah, I was supposed to call it diseased human binning. Something that, that reminds me, remember we started this looking at the original SRA data set that had the human reads in it, right? So do you have any guess what's gonna happen to those human reads when we do the binning? Bob, what would happen if I submitted reads for a human genome to this service? It would crash. It would crash first off because we can't assemble yeah. ukes with this, these assemblers. Actually, Megahit might try and assemble a uke. In any event, the stuff will most, most likely will fall on the floor because we're mapping to the bacterial references. Right. Although, and again, this would be an interesting experiment to do to bin the data that we've been here and to bin the data that came as a result of the FASTA utilities aligning run. Anyway. So here's our output. And again, this will, will probably look familiar to you. All of the job output has the same structure. And up at the top here, we've got two reports. We've got a binning report and a viral binning report. We'll start with the binning report. What this is gonna tell us 
is a summary of what it found in the binning run. So here we say we have zero good bins and one bad bin. So what's good and bad here? Part of the process of doing the binning is an estimate of genome quality for each of the bins that's created. And there's three main features that go into this quality check. There's one is a completeness percentage, which is if you're familiar with CheckM, we don't use CheckM itself. We would have, have our own implementation that's uh, more highly optimized, but it, it looks at single copy marker genes and it computes an estimate of completeness based on the presence or absence of those marker genes. We also have a contamination metric that looks at the number of occurrences of marker genes. If we have multiple occurrences of marker genes, that's an indication that there may be contamination in the sample. We also look at a metric called fine consistency. This is a metabolic consistency check where we look at the sets of functional roles in a reference database of what we call subsystems. Um, a subsystem, you can think of it as similar to a keg pathway where you've got a piece of metabolism with a set of roles on it. And we use a reference database of these pathways and you compute um, machine learning recognizers based on, we'll pull out one of the roles out of the set and compute how well we can predict the presence or absence of that role based on the, the presence of the, the rest of the roles. I'm mangling that. There's a whole paper on that too. But this will give us a value for each role that we have in the set in the annotated genome to say, should this role appear in this genome? And, it, and if it appears, how many copies should there be? And we can use that information to come up with this uh, consistency metric. So we, we use these three criteria, you can see here, that for, to be a good genome, it has to have more than 80% completeness, more than 87% fine consistency, and less than 10% contamination. It also has to have a FES protein. Remember, this, this was our seed gene that we used to find these of, of a reasonable size, where reasonable size means it uh, matches the sizes that, that exist in the reference database. So given all that, we can see for this genome that we've, we've got here, um, we've computed a, an overall score that's used to rank them. We've assigned a new genome ID. We've assigned it a genome name that it starts out with the reference genome, which is Haemophilus influenza, which you know we were happy to see here, right? Because that most of those reads were Haemophilus influenza. We pulled out a bin with that. Um, it gives us the genome identifier for the reference that it, that it used. We've got our consistency numbers. You know these are pretty good. Completeness is quite good, right? We've got 100% completeness, which means it had everything that we expected. We've got contamination, which you know, may or may not be surprising, given what else we saw in the classification. And now we've, we've just got some metrics. We have 17% hypothetical genes, 200 contigs, so it's pretty broken up, you know, and some sizes. One of the interesting metrics here is the set of potentially problematic roles. So what we're delving into here is that you're going to see this again when Jim talks. Because this, this dot right here is the output of the analysis pipeline. If we're stopped on it, we might as well just talk about it right Yeah. Now. Oh, I'll click on it and we can see what we've got here. So I clicked on that link. Do it again less quickly. Click on this link that says potentially problematic roles. That just takes us to the report page for the genome. And I'll get into where this shows up in a sec. This sort of recapitulates the information we saw before. Uh, with some more information that comes out of the predictors. So this data comes from the same predictor that came up with the consistency numbers. So what we found is that we've got 109 roles that are over-present, meaning that there were more instances of the proteins in this genome than we expected. There are 10 roles that had fewer instances than we expected. And we predicted a total of 1,500 roles. 547 of those were used to calculate completeness. We had 1,730 total roles and some more statistics there. So what this is showing us here is that this mouthful of a function, the predictor said, based on the functional role content of the rest of the genome, that we should have had one of these, but we actually had two. We have a link to those, and we've got some comments that if you parse through these, you can maybe be able to suss out what's going on. So this is a, a universal role. One of the, the representatives is PEG1175, uh, is in this contig, 
and it's a close match to this other protein in the reference. The other occurrence of this guy is in a different contig, which has no good roles and is short. Right? So this is a hint that maybe this other contig you know, shouldn't be here. If I click on this two features link, what this is going to do is take us and do a lookup in the database of the features. Okay, so it did come up. So we can see here that we've got a bunch of you know, things that may or may not be interesting. But a reason I brought you here is look at the compare region viewer. But what this visualization does is look at, let you look at the genes in question in the context that they occur in on the contig in, the, in their respective locations in the genome. Because remember, this is two features that are in the genome and where we expected there to only to be one. Do you have any questions while this is grinding away? I think one concept that maybe everybody gets it is what is the fear? What is that? What is binning and what is a fear? This is a metagenome example, right? It's not like a single, it's not like a petri dish with the pure colony of a single bacteria that you pick it out of and like prepped it, you got it very clean and it's pure. This is from some person's bone and they had an infection and there was stuff growing there and they got a complex mixture and they go through the magic of IP but sequencing, they can sequence everything in there. And we want to know what the bacteria is that's causing the infection, or maybe if there's multiple. We want to know what the bacteria are. And the binning process is after assembling reads into longer contiguous sets of DNA that might be like, instead of the reads being 150 bases long, the long contiguous strands might be 10,000 bases long, or maybe 100,000 bases long, longer stretches. Having done that process, figuring out which of those long contigs go together to constitute a single organism's genome, and then find the next organism and its genome together. So you can have these genomes that are representing, say, a species, or at least that would be the organism. If you got a pure culture, sequence the organism's genome in pure culture, you would get that, the ideal, if you want to re reconstruct that. And so in a metagenomic example, and you do binning, and you get multiple bins, each one is supposed to represent one different genome or organism or species that could be in the sample. And that's why it's relevant if you have the expected single copy of a gene, but you see two different copies of that gene, then it looks like maybe you got some contigs into your bin that are, shouldn't be there, and it might be good to sort them out if you're going to go to the metro. Based on that, we also did the taxonomic classification, which also identified potential contaminants because it's metagenomics. Why would you do one versus the other? Like, what is, I guess, the, yeah. The binning is the attempt to get a whole gene. So the text on the classification will tell you it's there, but the binning tries to put it all together. And the other thing that is important to keep in mind, there's a lot of binners out there. The one that we use right now is developed internally, trying to give you full, complete genomes. If you do like an axe spin or something like that, you'll get a distribution of incomplete genomes that are bins, but aren't full genomes. So, so this thing is designed to give you the genomes that are nearly or almost nearly. What we're looking at in this view are the proteins in this genome. And so we're looking at two different regions in the same genome, remember, is where we started here. And so the way to read this display is that the red gene is what we call the focus. You know, we came in on this gene and these are colored by function. So two arrows of the same color will have the same function. And we see this first peg 1175, and then here's this other one. And notice it's on this short little contig, right? That you can see this little vertical bar here marks one end of the contig, and you know there's one you can't see over here that marks the other end of, the, of this contig. You can tell you know this goes from location two to 943, so we know this is buttered up against the end of the contig. So this is just a real short little contig with four genes on it, and this protein shouldn't be here based on our predictors. So a reasonable guess would be that this contig just should not be part of this bin entirely, right? And so if you were going to 
do the next stage and sort of come up with a very clean reference genome that you've pulled out of your sample from the metagenomic reads, you would just remove this contig from the set of contigs that are making up your genome. But how do I know it's not a lateral transfer in of that? Because you're the biological expert and can make a much more reasoned argument for or against that than uh, the lowly software engineers can. Oh. Hey, you, you may be right, right? You know, there'd be... I would look you know. around and see if there were transposed elements perhaps right. or the tRNA gene. Yeah, let's see what's yeah. I would also look at the contig and see if it was bigger. But this is the whole contig here, right? Sure. I mean you can spend a lot of time going down rat holes. Yep. Let's see if this other one I, I clicked on the next now. Oh here we go. So this one I say clicked on this next one down here that was predicted to have one and we had four of them. And again, this looks familiar, right? We've got three of these that are on a small contig, which has no good roles. So if we look at this. How are you getting to the comparison from the, from the table? When you click on the four features, oh, okay. it takes, I'll do this again. It takes you to first to the, the list of features, and then you can click on the compare region right. tab. If it gives you no results, like you wait a few minutes and it's not going to, it means either that he gets in my account and the genome isn't shared yet, or that it's really slow, which yeah. I predict. Yeah, we don't be indexed yet. Here, watch, right. um, so this is the one in the example, and it's, yeah. it's owned by Rebecca, and I don't know if we made, we probably we didn't share that to public. everybody, so, yeah. But if you ran it yourself, except we've updated the pipeline a little mm -hmm. bit, because one of the problems was the contamination was the number of contigs, the size of the contigs, so this is sort of a, a funny display because what we've got are three chunks of this gene, right? We have three genes with all the same name. And if you look at what these lines are, we've got three rows in, the, in this display that are exactly the same piece of the, the, the same contig. This first row, the second row, and the last row are each centered on a different chunk of this possibly frame-shifted gene. So the other interesting thing is that this one that is on the long contig. This is one the one little contig, and this is on the longer contig. So again, you know, my guess would be that either this really is contamination from something else, or it's just assembly artifact, or who knows what. So we notice that um, with these reds here are different shades, and we've got this little oval blob here. The way we color the red is by doing a blast from this top focus peg against all of the corresponding pegs here. And the length and position of the oval is where the blast hit is in each of these guys to the focus. And the, the intensity um, is a representation of the strength of the blast hit, that the full red is perfect hit, and then the lighter reds are, are as you get further and further away. White means that there was no blast similarity between the peg and the, and the focus. So let's see. So in short, it looks like probably a broken change broken gene or or some you know and something with one that is more interesting the one that's on the longer thing even though it has a dead. yeah so this one's probably real in this display if you double click it will go and switch the view to look at the one you clicked on i mean it's going to scroll through this a little bit i think there are 109 of these so that there's a lot to look at but here's another a, a different case where this particular protein you we were predicted to have one but it was not found but it also says that the role was not present in, in the reference genome, which is a little funny, right? This is a side effect of the fact that these predictors were trained on you know, large groups of genomes. And you're looking at the average characteristics of that group, you know, a average used lightly. But there are cases where something that was in, in the predictors is not actually in the reference genome. So that's, that this is probably fine, right, this guy assuming your reference genome is correct, right? We're basing all of this on assumptions made about the reference genome, which may or may not be correct because, you know, quality varies throughout the database from, you know, wherever the data came from. And also remember, I remember back looking at the BAM file being mapped against the reference, right? There were places we know that there were things in, in the reference that we didn't have reads for. And you know, that's sort of an, an indication that the reference doesn't exactly match what we're looking at in the sample. Last thing on this page, I was going to point out that there's this other summary 
of the problematic roles that on a per contig basis, you can see for each contig how long it is and how many good quality features there are on there. And you, we've got this tail here that there's no good features on. So the, these guys may all be a little bit questionable, right? These are all, you know, 400 base pair contigs, which is in, you know, not really long enough to do much of anything. Things to contemplate while you're looking at the data. And that's still grinding away. I'm going to go back here to the job. We also look at the viral bidding report. This one isn't nearly as interesting because we don't have as much data on the viruses. Like I mentioned before, this uses check V to try to identify bins as belonging to a virus out of the IMG database and one of the NCBI reference databases. For each of the hits we get, we get an identifier for the virus, the taxon ID, name of it, and some statistics. And we see this not annotated non-link that it, if we were able to annotate the virus using the uh, BVBRC viral annotation, we'd see a link to that annotated virus, but because we can't annotate and we don't pollute the database with an annotated viruses. So it's, you know, we see phages, actually a lot of phages here. We see some really ugly names here that these come out of a, I think it's a metavirome database that CheckV also uses to figure out what this means, we'd have to go reference back to the, the original database that I think we have references for somewhere here. And to be honest, we haven't done a lot with the viral binning. We haven't had users that have been, had a great big call for using it. But if you're interested, if you have something you'd like to see in this, you know, we should talk because we'd love to have input from folks on things that would be useful here. And you showed how you could use either start with reads yep. or con? Start with reads or contigs. And in fact, remember I mentioned that you might want to run the binning a couple different ways. One of the files that's generated here is this contigs at fast A. This is the output of the assembly run that was used for the binning. So if I wanted to rerun the binning and say, just do the viral binning on this data set, I wouldn't have to spend the time doing a reassembly. Actually, I'll just let's just do that. I'll show you what it looks like. We'll do the binning from the contigs. So I'm gonna go back to binning. I'm gonna click here to assemble contigs. And I'm going to go browse to the workshop. Binning, contigs that passed. Hey, there's my contigs file. Now let's say I just wanna look at viruses. I wanna go here. So what this is going to do is start with this contigs file and do just a viral binning. You know, once you've got the assembled data, the binning runs typically pretty quickly. You know, again, if you've got a monster data set, it's going to take a while, but much faster than the assembly part of the job. Let's go back, see what else we have in here. There's a bunch of statistics files in here that are sort of artifacts of the binning run. They probably don't mean anything, but you, they um, give you some idea of what the bidding was up to. And if you're, you are want to really geek out and go deep into this, we'll get you in touch with Bruce, who's the guy, the guy who did this, and he will tell you all about it. If you're going to be doing any computational work, this bins.json file is a machine-readable form of the information about all of the contigs that are in the bin and some other information about the bin. So if you were perhaps doing a big set of metagenomic binning runs and you, you're maintaining your own little database of things, you could use the data in this file to bootstrap the information you're keeping. You get some information on the coverage that we had. I'm not gonna try and make it up because I don't know, but anyways, information on the coverage. You had said that you had wanted to know how this was assembled. We don't directly have the mechanism of assembly, but the fact that we have a spades log file here shows that this job was assembled with metaspades. And in fact, if you wanted to, perhaps for the purposes of publishing, get some of the metadata that Spades gives you when it runs. I think Spades has a measure of coverage in it, which is different than the coverage out of our assembly service. So the other thing that is in here are the actual bins themselves, right? If I wanted to do further analysis with the data, I'd want to have the actual FASTA file of, of the bins. And that's what here, we have this, you know, bin 1727, this is uh, bin one of the uh, 727 is the tax ID of the genome that we're running. And so here we only had one bin, so we only have one bin file. 
we have a file here with a flag on it, which is the output of the annotation run for that guy. If you want to look at the underlying annotation, we've got the FASTA files for all the viral bins. If you want to do anything more with the viral data, would you take that bin and annotate it, or it's already annotated? It's already annotated. It does. So if we go back to our binning report. That's the second thing on the line here is the genome ID that was assigned for this genome. And if you click on this, it will take you to the, you know, we mentioned the virtual integration that when you annotate a genome in BVBRC, it gets added to the database as a private genome that you could. Now that's Bob clicking on it because he's pretending to be me. If you click on it, you won't get anywhere. Unless you ran it yourself. You made it public. Yeah, if you did, ran it yourself, then you. See what happens when you run things yourself? You feel like you're part of the pack. It's a feeling of unity with all of us. That's why I encourage you to do it. But just so you know, it's not that the website's broken. This belongs to me. Popping back a couple of things. Remember, I, I had double clicked on this protein of interest uh, that was in, in the broken in three pieces on one of the contigs. So here I'm looking at the one copy that wasn't broken, and this is Haemophila influenza clonal population. And this is comparing it to instances of that gene across all, all the taxonomy. We see it's as long as the rest of them. It has you know, fairly good blast similarity, given, given that this closest one is over in Vibrio. And a good thing to point out is that once you have annotated you can assemble a genome and you can use the context for several services in the system, or you can take a delay and submit them in bank if you want Propia, whatever, for that thing. But to build trees, to use it as a reference that you want to do a SNP analysis on, to do it for genome alignment using law. To look at the protein families, do comparative services, to look at pathways, subsystems, and protein families, has to be annotated in the resource. The annotation pipeline is the Rosetta Stone that all the other services depend on. So you don't have to do it if you want to, to do the other stuff. Or this could just be your stepping off point, and you can take it to another resource and do what you want with it. But for Almost all of our downstream services, you need this genome. To work with genomes, you need the genome. To, you need it to be annotated. What's the difference between the unbin and the un, unplaced? If we go back to the picture, if I recall it correctly, we get leftovers from each of the 12 mer amino acid binning phase and the 50 mer DNA phase. And what I'm guessing, because we noticed those files were almost the same size, and it may be the case that the in, in this case, the 50 mer one didn't bring any back in. I, I believe that's the case. I think the, I think the paper talks about that too. The data that could not be mapped to the selected or organisms is the unbin FASTA. The unplaced FASTA file includes the contigs that actually map the unmatched 12 mer contigs that can be seen in the diagram that you talked about.